Who is King Saul? <clears throat> Excuse me, King Solomon. I knew I was gonna say that. Gretchen, who's King Solomon? That's what I'm asking. He's, he's the third king of the United Kingdom. And also the last one. There was Saul, David, and Solomon. And Solomon's the reason why the kingdom split. And that's kind of sad. As wise as he was, uh, he was the reason why it split. Um, he was a very deeply religious fellow. And I want you to look with me in 1 Kings chapter 3. Because there's a couple of things I noticed there that I hadn't, I don't know if I'd ever seen before, and that's hard for me to do because I've studied Solomon in the Old Testament quite a lot. But in verse 3 it says of 1 Kings 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except what? He sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. What are the high places? They're the places where idolatrous worship took place. It's interesting that he goes to those places, but he's offering a sacrifice to God, right? That's what I think he's doing. Later on, he begins to sacrifice to, uh, to gods, but I think the comedy made here is that he's loving the Lord, but sacrificing in the wrong place. Because look at the next verse. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for there, that was what? The great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Who did he offer them to? To God, Jehovah. And so he's in the wrong place uh, for whatever reason. And so uh, these altars had already been brought in and there are already some idolatrous influences there. And so God's going to help him by building a temple so that helps them give him a place to worship. Where's the tabernacle? This place should be worshiping. Don't know, do we? So anyway, at Gibeon, verse 5, while he's still at Gibeon offering these thousand sacrifices, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask, what shall I give you? Did you ever think that he asked that when he was just a small child? I always had that impression, but he's already ruling as a king. And so obviously we know the rest of the story. What did he ask God for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Curtis, why? Yeah, that's what we usually think, isn't it? And let's read that. He says, uh, You have shown, verse 6, great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart. With you, you have continued this great kindness for him. You have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go in, out or come in. Does he mean that literally, or is that a figure? Say what do you think? Yeah. I th a little child. Yeah. I think he's just talking about it in a figurative sense, and that's something I never never caught before. Because he's already king, and we probably go back and figure out how old he was when he became king, but he's not a little child. He's saying he is because he doesn't know enough. Have you ever said, I'm, I got the wisdom of a child, or I'm just a, a child? Of course, we sometimes say you're acting like a child. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. Uh, so I think that's something to think about anyway. So in verse 9, he says, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between what? Good and evil. Now, we need judges in America today to pray that prayer. We need politicians in America to pray that prayer because he's not just asking for wisdom because he hasn't got anything better to do. He, he's feeling the pressure of being the king, and he wants to be a good king, and he wants to follow in the footsteps of his father David. And so God grants him just a little bit of wisdom, right? What did he grant? That's right. 
And he said, Behold, verse 12, I have done according to your words. He have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you did not ask, riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So that's an amazing dream that he's having, and what an amazing blessing. And so he receives not only wisdom, but also riches, honor, and fame. Now let's think about that a minute. Is it better if you're wise when you receive riches, honor, and fame? And the thought I had was, what happens to people that win the lottery overnight and they become multimillionaires? Do they have the wisdom and understanding to handle that money? Usually they're broke in a few years and the relatives show up from all over the place. Having a lot doesn't mean you're going to be able to keep a lot. When I lived in East Texas uh, in the 30s and 40s, that was a boom area for oil. And a lot of people worked hard in the oil fields and made a lot of money, and several of them became millionaires. And I heard of one story about a man who left all of his millions to a son and a daughter. And the daughter just put hers in the bank and just lived off of it, and she was doing pretty good. The son had about $5 million and invested in a restaurant, and in five years he was broke. So it just shows you wisdom is necessary to handle money properly. But notice in verse 14, he said, If Solomon walked in God's ways and keep his statutes, then God would lengthen his life. That's one of your questions, by the way, in, one of the, in your worksheet, so catch that. But isn't that true for everybody? What does God say in Ephesians chapter 6? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And so assuming you have wise parents, it's always better to listen to your parents. But don't you think at a, as a, at a young age that you think, oh, my parents are old-fashioned, they don't know anything? How many of you thought your parents were wise when you were a teenager? Just one? Two? Y'all not lying, are you? <laughs> David, how about you? Did you? Did you raise your hand, sort of? I thought my father was wise, but I also thought he was old fogey, so. <laughs> but lesson number one is we should all ask for wisdom, right? So again, define wisdom. And based on not what you've heard before, but what you saw in our text in 1 Kings 3. Wisdom in that context is what? David? The proper way to use the knowledge that you have. Well, that's what we used to say. But be more specific. See if you have... Discernment? Yeah, discernment. To discern good and evil, right and wrong. And that's what wisdom is really all about. As David said, we used to define wisdom as the proper use of knowledge. And that's, that's a good definition. But we see from Solomon here that he's asking for the ability to to uh, discern his people and God gives him tremendous wisdom so when he starts building the temple uh, he has that kind of wisdom too how many of you would be wise enough to build a, a fancy house Anybody? Adam could you do that wouldn't be fancy Curtis how about you if you, yeah how long would it take you to build this temple Solomon's building yeah, at least. If, if you have all the help that he had. That's right. <laughs> but lesson number one here is that, just, well, it's two or three actually. Justice is important to God. God said, You have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. And what is justice? We all want justice, don't we? You go to court, do you want justice? What is it? What? Right thinking. Right thinking. That's a little more than that. Um, Angela? Fairness. Fair treatment. Justice to everybody. And so that's what that is. Uh, Solomon wants to treat everybody like he'd want to be treated. And is it easy to be a judge or hard? Clyde, is it hard or easy to be a judge? Why? Why? 
Clyde said people can be very deceptive and it's hard to see through their deception. And to be a good judge, that's exactly what Solomon's asking for. Give me the wisdom so that I can discern right and wrong in these difficult situations. Uh, if you don't think that's the case, go up to the Platte County Courthouse and sit in there for about a day and watch. Because I've been there a lot, not on my own behalf. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a couple of trials, and that's fascinating too. Adam? Just come ride with me for a couple of nights. Same thing, huh? Assume that everybody's lying to you. Isn't that something? Yes. Yeah. Adam says you assume everybody's lying and you work your way from there, huh? Kind of sad, but that's just how life is, so you've got to be very careful. But Jesus Christ rules in righteousness and judgment. We had a sermon a while back about righteousness. We generally define that as the state of being right, but it also assumes a what? If righteousness is a state of being right, it assumes what? Law or a standard of righteousness. In America, do we have a standard of righteousness, really? We're supposed to. What is it supposed to be? Constitution of the United States, but our politicians are walking all over that Constitution, disregarding it, disrespecting it, and then they want us to obey them. That's the problem. It starts at the top and works its way down. If the, if the king, like Solomon, is going to be a just and, and righteous judge, then everybody below him is going to respect that and try to follow suit. If you've got a wicked, corrupt ruler, then everybody underneath him says, well, rules don't count. We'll just do what we want to. And the world is full of chaos. And we'll see that in a moment. In Matthew 12, 18, saying, talking about Jesus, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare what? Justice, justice to the Gentiles. And the ultimate justice is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in contrast to that, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier things of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. So are these wise leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees? They're the religious leaders of Israel, but when John the Baptist came along, he said, Behold, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. What that mean? Chop what down? Tree. What tree? <laughs> Tim? I think it's yeah, it's the nation. The nation's on the verge of being destroyed because of stuff like this, and they don't even know it. Later on in Jesus' ministry, he says, you can see the signs of the weather, you know, when the storm's coming, but you can't discern the, the times among you now. They couldn't see the ungodliness and the immorality that was destroying the country, and in about 40 years it was totally destroyed. So we need to be more aware today. Don't think that the country's getting away with anything because we do wicked. So again, poor judges. This was important in Israel, and it's important today. Exodus 23, 2. Do not follow a crowd to do evil. Well, I thought if everybody's doing it, it's okay. No. Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to discern, to turn aside after many to pervert justice. Don't be a false witness. Don't be in cahoots with somebody to lie about someone. Can you think of any trials in the Bible that were dishonest trials? Christ is the first one to think of. He was tried in every illegal way possible. So it shows you what happens. The nation's corrupt because the leaders are corrupt. But think in the Old Testament of another one. Emily? Joseph? Joseph? Yeah, I suppose that wasn't who I had in mind. That's all right. Joseph was mistreated too. He, he didn't get a fair, he didn't really get a trial, did he? All who? All the no, in the Old Testament. Yeah, Paul and Silas, Paul would often claim his right, rights as a Roman. I'll give you a hint. This fellow had a vineyard, and a wicked king wanted it. <laughs> Naboth. Do you remember what happened there? He tried to buy it, and Naboth wouldn't sell it because it's his family heritage, and family was important to the Israelites. So he goes home, and he literally gets on his bed and turns his face to the wall like about a two-year-old. And Jezebel says, what are you crying about? And he said, well, Naboth wouldn't sell me his vineyard. So she said, well, I'll go get it for you. How did she do that? 
I mean, you have a disgusting look on your face, so tell us how Jezebel got the uh, Emily. And Mankin's not here, so. Okay, uh, well, he's. Jezebel. Okay, Jezebel got people to misrepresent and tell lies about him. They stoned him to death. And so that shows you why this is a bad thing. Did he God? Yeah, he didn't blaspheme anybody, did he? Deuteronomy 16, 19, you shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Do you know any wealthy people in America that have gotten the a good deal because they paid off somebody somewhere along the way? Yeah, we can name some names, but we won't. Deuteronomy 24, 17, You shall not pervert justice do the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. Who were the most susceptible to being mistreated by the courts in Israel? The widows and the orphans or childless. Uh, Parentless, I guess you should say. All right, we need to get on because we're going to run out of time. Who wants to tell us a story about Solomon's famed wisdom? The first illustration of how he demonstrated that he was a wise judge. Tim, you want to try? Okay. That's not quite right. Yeah, that's another one. Gretchen's got it. Yeah. Thankfully, there was that motherly love that protected her own child. Okay. They were actually two harlots, both living together in the same house. They both had a baby. In the middle of the night, one mother rolled over on her baby and smothered it to death. In the middle of the night, she got up and switched babies with the other lady. The lady wakes up and she sees her baby. That's not my baby. It's dead, but it's not mine. Do you think a mother would know her own baby after 24 to 48 hours? Sure. And so... Uh, she switches sons, and that's what caused the controversy. So they go to Solomon, and they, he, they say, well, the, you know, they both say, that's my child. So he says, well, just cut that baby in half, give it half to each, and that way everybody will be happy. Did he really mean that? No, but with kings, you wouldn't mess with that. So the mother says, no, let her have it. I'd rather the baby live. And Solomon says, okay, that's the real mother. Because the other one said, yeah, fine with me. Let's cut this baby in half. Wow. So what's impressive about that is in chapter 3 of, of this First Kings, it talks about the results of this. <clears throat> and it says in verse 28, All Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. You see what a good ruler can do to a nation and what a wicked ruler can do to a nation? And so Solomon's a great judge because God gave him tremendous wisdom and this demonstrated it and boy, the word got out, didn't it? And here we are 3,000 years later still talking about it and what a wise choice that was on his part. And that was just the beginning of his demonstration of his wisdom throughout his reign. Now here's a question. Did Israel prosper under his leadership? Absolutely, more than any other time. And so it shows you what wise leaders do. All right. Now we have the building of God's house, which is pretty impressive. Uh, why was David, this is your lesson sheet, question one under G, why was David not allowed to build the temple? He wanted to. Wendell? A man of war who'd shed blood, and of course he did so as a king, 
and even before he became a king because he was a soldier first. So that's the right answer. Anybody put something different or want to add to that? That's pretty much it, isn't it? Where did David purchase land for the temple? Because once he found out he couldn't build the temple, he started gathering items for the temple and also purchased some land. Anybody got that one? Why? Well, let's stop and think about it. Where was the temple? On what mountain? We talked about this last night. Moriah. Mount Moriah. So guess where David bought the land? Mount Moriah. And guess what had happened there earlier? That's where Abraham offered Isaac. When God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as an altar on Mount Moriah. So that's a historical, very uh, holy place in God's eyes, and I think also should be in ours. Okay. Well, the first thing we learned is that early in his kingship, he wanted to build that temple. All right, I'm the king now. God's going to let me build the temple, and I'm thankful that I have the chance. So lesson one for us is you always put God first, right? First in your money, first in your time, first in your lives. That's not easy to do because to really put God first, you have to set things aside. And it's not easy, it's not convenient, but it's the right thing to do. Number two, David was forbidden and he purchased the land. We've already covered that. So now Solomon builds the temple. He was chosen by God because way back in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17, when God told David, you can't build the temple, but he said, a son will be raised up after you from your loins, and he will build the temple. Now, is that talking about Solomon or Jesus Christ? Both. So dual fulfillment, dual prophecy. And so Solomon's fulfilling it by building the physical temple, and it's also a spiritual one. Four years into his reign, this begins... And the temple represents God's presence. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 20. Because after the temple's built and it's being dedicated, I love Solomon's answer there. He says in verse 18, But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and the supplication of the Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night, toward the place where you said you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. And on this prayer goes, this dedication goes, and that's the whole symbol of the temple. It represents God's presence. Now where in the temple is God's presence most obvious? The Holy of Holies. And so keep that in mind as well, and we'll go along here. So that's how Solomon was chosen. That's question number three under G. All right, how large was the temple? Anybody fill that out? Yeah, let's have some numbers. Patty, how much? I think I got those numbers, but there is there's a picture of the uh, Ark of the Covenant and the things that well, that's impressive. Okay, I've got twenty cubits square for the Holy of Holy, forty cubits for the holy place. Um, and here's something interesting you don't always realize. Here's the holy place, and on either side there are levels, three levels of chambers. What they do with that stuff? That's storage for the temple. And it faced the east, and there was a porch, portico, and it has two bronze pillars named Yekin and Boaz. So that's kind of, I think that's interesting. So that's very similar to what's that look like as far as the layout goes? The tabernacle. The tabernacle. Very, very similar to it. Because you have the holy place and the most holy place of the holy of holies. One of our other questions is, who was allowed to go in the holy of holies once a year? The high priest. And what did he do? Offered blood for himself and then for the people. Offered blood for himself and then for the people. 
And something we don't read about in the Bible, but it's an interesting fact, is he had a cord tied around his foot. So if something happened and he died, they could pull him out. So how would you like to be the high priest? <laughs> Trying to do everything you can, and you still could be struck dead. Here are the bronze pillars. If you guys are builders, you might be interested in this. Out 10 cubits from the temple wall. They are built. Um, here's the capitals that go on top. And all the dimensions, 18 cubits high, 17 and a half cubits, not including the um, capital. And so that's pretty interesting too. So there's a, a porch to it as well, a portico. Now, what was the bronze altar for? That's question six. Animal sacrifice, exactly right. Now, this is bigger than we think, but that's probably not a good drawing, but it's the one I found. But here you have the four corners, and blood was often sprinkled or poured on those four corners, and also on the animal, and it's, this is kind of like a barbecue pit, to use a better term, a less holy term. That's, they're de definitely offering sacrifice. Now, if you're a priest and you're offering sacrifice, what job does that look like to the ordinary citizen? A butcher. We don't think of the priest, we think of them wearing white outfits and being very holy and, and stain free, but these guys were, were butchers. They had to cut up the meat, portion it out. Some belonged to God, some they were able to keep, and it had to be cut just so many ways. And, and each sacrifice, for whatever it was for, had a different requirement. So they had to know a long list of, well, this sacrifice is for this kind of sin and this sacrifice is for that kind of sin and so on and so forth. So when you burned a lot of animal sacrifices on this bronze altar, um, that was a dirty job, wasn't it? Where was that altar located, by the way? The outer, court. outer court in front of the temple. So it wasn't, you don't go into the temple, but... Um, it was made of field stones, according to Exodus 20, 25, but that would be the older altar. Um, that's the one for the tabernacle. Okay. The bronze laver. What's the bronze laver? What was it for? And where was it located? That's three good questions. It's also in the court. It's also in the court. Wendell, what have you got? It was a wash basin used by the priest. It's a wash basin for those guys to clean up after. Susie, is that what you had? Yeah. And what are these guys down here on the bottom? Golden oxen for decoration purposes. But that held a lot of water, 11,000 gallons if it went to the brim. So you're talking about a big basin and, of course, washing all these animals and trying to get your hands and things clean. It took a lot. Uh, you can read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 4. Then you had ten smaller labors on either side, five on each side of the temple. So imagine this being the temple wall. And there are five of them that are smaller, probably used for the same purposes for the priest to wash in uh, besides that one big labor. Okay, any questions about that? Steve? Steve? as far as I know, yeah. Here's the porch. There are the two pillars that were built. And this is, of course, a representation. But they did a pretty good job. Uh, and so you have that leading into the... Here's the... 18 feet around and 35 feet higher, the dimensions I have for that. And here's the courtyard to give you an idea of what it looked like. And right here is the the porch or the temple itself and then you have the bronze altar sitting right there obviously that's the bronze laver beside her to the bronze pool of water there are the five basins on that side and there's five more on the other side and so that's kind of the outlay for the temple and that was built in Solomon's day how long did that temple last? 
So the Babylonians came and tore it down. What date was that? 587 B.C. Very good, Susie. So that's excellent, yeah. Here's another rendition of it. Can you imagine walking into the holy place and you see these uh, seven lampstands and these golden doors and all the ornate dressings? And you can read that. If you read chapter 6 through 9, you read the description of all these things. And it's a very detailed description of it. So that's what's impressive. Now inside the temple, you've got lampstands, as we pointed out, as you just saw. You have the table of showbread right here. What was done with that? It's called showbread. Yeah, there's 12 loaves on there, six. I've seen different representations, either six layers, I mean, six sections of two each or two with six each, but there's 12 loaves for the tribes. And as Bill said, if you didn't hear him, on the Sabbath, they ate the old bread, took it off, and it was out of service, and they ate that. And then they put new bread on, fresh bread on for the next week. And who in the Old Testament and his men in an emergency situation ate the showbread that they were not supposed to? King David. Oh, well, he wasn't king yet, but David. Very good. Then you have the altar of incense. What was burned on the altar of incense inside the holy place? Special formula <laughs> of what? What do we call it? Incense. In Revelation, it talks about the prayers of the saints being like the incense of the old temple that goes up to the nostrils of God. So God loves to hear your prayers. It smells like sweet incense to his nostrils. And then there's the veil of the temple that partitioned the holy place from the most holy. And that was used how many times a year? Just that one time. And when Jesus died, what happened to that veil? It was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, why? Well, that's not our subject tonight, but we'll just talk about it quickly. Why? I've heard several theories. The Bible doesn't actually say why, but there's a couple of, there's a couple of possibilities. <clears throat> the one I always thought, Steve, you got one? Yeah, Steve said it may symbolize the fact that now everyone had the right to go into the most holy place by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the most holy place symbolized what? Heaven. 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 So that's true. And that may be one possibility. The other one I always heard before that, which I don't know which is, is right. Hebrews talks about that. The way into the holiest of all was made possible by Jesus Christ. And so that certainly symbolized that. But I also have heard and thought that when that veil was torn in two, that God was departing the temple because he was no longer recognizing Israel as his people, that his nation, and he would no longer keep his presence there. And so he tore the, the veil in two. There's earthquake, people rising from the dead a week later, and all kinds of terrible things happening to tell the world this is something that offends God greatly. So, would you say the temple's an important place? If you were a Jew, how important was it to your life as a Jew? It means everything. And when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and every stone was taken down, and all these beautiful facilities were hauled off, did they melt them down to use them themselves? No. Don't you remember when uh, they kept them in? David? And some were probably, but Dave, what'd you say? Cyrus, I think, sent some of them back. He did. Yeah, and, and what caused, the, remember the, the handwriting on the wall? The king of Persia was, was drinking out of the, the vessels up from the temple. And God just said, well, you're done. And so there had to be some, they had saved him and preserved him in a, in a sacred place uh, and then were, were abused. Anyway, I will charge extra for that. The Ark of the Covenant goes inside the holy place, most holy place rather, 
And what was inside at this time, what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? What used to be in Moses' day was in there? The budded, Aaron's budding rod. The two tablets of the Ten Commandments. What? In a pot of manna. By the time of Solomon, what's left? Just the Ten Commandments. So we don't know what happened to the budding rod or the bread. It just disappeared. All right, temple materials. How much time we got left? Well, a little bit. Cost about $5 million to build the temple in today's money. That'd be a minute. How many of you guys want to finance that? Jeffrey Bezos. What? Jeffrey Bezos could, couldn't he? I wish he'd do something with his money that was worthwhile, yeah. Now, here's a question that I want to ask. Well, let's just talk about it. It was made of cedar beams and boards from Lebanon. King Hiram was hired by Solomon, and he was a friend of David's. He gathered cedar, cypress, and algum trees. They floated those things down the Mediterranean to, to Joppa, and at Joppa they, they made rafts out of them, so at Joppa they cut them apart and hauled them over land to Jerusalem. Pretty impressive. The inner structure was all made of wood and it was overlaid with gold. So we're not talking about solid gold, but uh, how valuable are cedar, cypress, and algum? Tim, how, how valuable are they? The smell would be tremendous, but also what else? Susie? Well, cedar does not rot. Cedar does not rot. It'll petrify, but it won't rot. And cypress, same way. So it's very permanent wood. This just, you're not, it not only does that, it smells good and keeps bugs away. So it's the best wood you can use to build a house from. And I've got a story about a mailbox out here in front of the church building that had a cedar post in it. If you want to hear that story, ask me after class. <clears throat> the outer structure was of massive stones. The stone cutters fashioned them, and the, the chief stone cutter was from Tyre. And Solomon's men under him, who were also very skilled stone cutters, they worked underneath him. But every stone was formed at a distance from Jerusalem, so there'd be no sound near the temple grounds where that was made. Now, why do all this? Because does God dwell in temples made with hands? Solomon said that he didn't. Why spend all this money for something like this? And why don't we do that today? So we just don't do it because we don't know how. Uh, David? Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting answer. What about back then? Why spend $5 billion in today's money? Gretchen? Very good. All the ornate building, and I mean this is massive building, but it told everybody God is the most important thing in this nation. And he wanted, it's, like Gretchen said, it's nothing more than a shadow of what's to come in the New Testament. But that shadow is tremendous. But the lesson we learn is as massive and as beautiful and as expensive as the temple was, if it's a shadow, what is greater than that? The church, which is the Lord's temple today. And you and I being part of it, it's a temple that will never fade away. And so when we die, we'll be transported into the eternal temple. But until then, we're here on this earth. So we should revere God because the temple represents God dwelling among us. And we need to keep that in mind. So what's more important, money or people? People are. And people make up the temple. And how did the people get to be part of the temple today? How do you get in the church? The Lord adds you, but how does he do that? When you obey the gospel and you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. How valuable is the blood of Jesus? It's worth more than $5 billion. Okay. Then Solomon had a dedication. It took seven years to build that temple. And, and Curtis, that's with about 30,000 helpers to start with. 30,000. I, I wouldn't even know how to tell 30,000 people what to do. 
Did you think that'd be a cha challenge? It'd be a little bit of a challenge. Wouldn't it? Several of them, if he was given instructions, that they would instruct him. So you'd have subcontractors, yeah. yeah. It'd be a, an outstanding job. They took vessels and treasures that David had collected and dedicated and put them inside the temple. Tim, you got a comment? the blueprint didn't you? Yeah. yeah well you think about that Moses built a tabernacle according to the pattern given to him so do you think God would not give David the pattern for the temple there's a lesson there too um, so we're now on H in our question sheet how many sheep and oxen were sacrificed according to 1 Kings 8 and verse 5 innumerable couldn't be so think about those poor priests you talk about a hard day's work i don't know how many priests there were but they're they're sacrificing oxen and sheep to the point where you can't keep up and you can't count them all wouldn't that be something how many of you would like to see that once in your life Gretchen, you and adam would what uh, innumerable amounts, I'm sure. You're right. It wasn't exactly a pretty picture, was it? Question two under H, where was the Ark of the Covenant placed? We already said that, but in the Holy of Holies. And uh, why did the priest have to stop ministering at the temple when this was going on? Curtis? The glory of the Lord filled the presence and it was a big cloud and they couldn't see what they were doing. They had to stop. And again, God is saying, that's how important I am. I'm in control. You guys do what I say. Tim? Yeah, when we had those uh, critical of the, of the guards and whoever uh, was playing, it talks about a row of windows along the top yeah. up there. And that's why when God came down to the presence and shining off all that gold, that light was shining out through those windows. Uh, what a sight. Yes, it would be. Yeah, well, that'd be an honor, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. I think so, too. All right. On page two of the back side of your sheet, we've got a couple of true faults. True faults, God made a covenant with Solomon. It's true. And number two, Solomon had a naval force. True. true. Solomon reigned 52 years. False. False. How many years? 40. 40 years. Uh, number four, Solomon built shrines to false gods to please his foreign wives. True. True. There's a lady, a friend of ours in Kilgore, Texas. Every time I saw her, we were talking about Solomon. She had the one question to ask every time. She said, Wayne, if Solomon was so smart, how come he had so many wives? <laughs> I said, I don't know. You'll have to ask Solomon. That wasn't a very wise thing, was it? And number five, true or false, shortly after Solomon's death, the nation of Israel divided. True. What do we call the divided nations? Israel and Judah. Bill, don't say it out loud. Let somebody else have a chance. Which king ruled which kingdom? Because they both have the similar names. One starts with an R and one starts with a J. Susie, you know? You got, yeah, you got it backwards. Yeah, Rehoboam is the son of Solomon who unwisely split the kingdom by not agreeing to lower taxes. You know, all this stuff costs money. And so when Solomon dies, the, the princes come to Rehoboam and say, we need you to lower our taxes. It's just, we can't handle this anymore. And he went and talked to his young advisors. And they said, well, if you give in to that, they'll think you're a weak king. So you just tell them it's going to be worse. So he told me, he said, I'm going to tax you guys more than my father. So they said, well, that's the case. We're out of here. And they, they left. Ten tribes took off and became Israel. And they were led by who? Jeroboam. Jeroboam, who was chosen by God to be the king. But he wanted Jeroboam to trust in God. He said, if you'll follow me, then I'll bless you. And you'll have a dynasty for your children. 
What was Jeroboam's downfall? Golden calf, I mean calves to worship at Dan and Bethel because he was afraid of what? Afraid the Israelites would go back to Jerusalem to worship in the temple and their hearts would be turned away from him and he'd lose his kingship. But God said, if you'll trust me, I'll take care of you. He couldn't see that, could he? Good lesson for us. Uh, Kay in our lesson sheet, uh, since we're running out of time, the temple represented God's presence among the people. Does God still dwell among his people today? How? Well, that's not a good answer. God is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. But he's with us in a special way. You walk, Curtis? Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm kind of looking for the answers on the sheet. Jesus said that he'd be with us at the Lord's Supper. Yeah. That was Teach them, Teach them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always. Yeah. Same thing God told Solomon. You walk in my ways and follow my statutes, and I'll bless you forever. What is so hard about following God's law? Every generation, including the church from the time Jesus built it in 33 AD to the now, man does not want to do what God says. They always have some way to improve and make it better. What, why is that? Gretchen? I agree, yeah. Uh, Gretchen said that God's ways are kind of counterintuitive from man's ways and wisdom. In other words, God's plan is not big enough for us, is it? And yet we're insulting him by saying we know better. Tim, you had an answer too. Yeah, I just said, you know, that's the answer. That was it, David? Yeah, God uh, is smarter than But if you ask man, he'll never say, I think I'm smarter than God. He does it in his actions. Right. Okay, N and O in our letters. Uh, what kind of temple do we have today? 1 Corinthians 3, 6. That's the church. So do not defile the temple of God, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye, plural, are. And then, oh, what other kind of temple am I? 1 Corinthians six nineteen. What? Individual, and I'm the temple of what, Curtis, you said earlier? Temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have in you, you're not your own. So those are all important. Okay, let's go through this quickly. I hate to run out of time. We've already covered all of this anyway. Um, the dedication prayer. Solomon said, The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. And he did dwell in it until they broke the covenant, right? Here's the covenant, chapter 9. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. My eyes my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes, my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So that's a very important covenant because basically what God is saying is, Solomon, you follow my way and my will, and you'll have a dynasty to follow from here on out. Did Solomon keep that covenant? No. So there we go. We have a wise man. All right, here's the important question. Because tomorrow night we're studying what king? Hezekiah. And what's Hezekiah's quality? That reminds me. Steve, you want to pass those outlines out for tomorrow night? Hezekiah is a loyal heart. Adam can help you out, Steve. A loyal heart. Be sure you get one of those for tomorrow night.
He goes on to say in verses 1 through 9, If you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus? to this land and this house. Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. So based on this passage, would you say it's easier to walk by faith or by sight? Well, it's easier to walk by sight. Because to walk by faith, you have to see, don't you? The spiritual values and kind of expand on what Gretchen was saying we don't see the spiritual as much as we see the physical right how impressed should we be here tonight that God's presence is with us is that impressive would you be more impressed if the building was chock full and people were standing outside wanting to get in you say oh we're doing something great now and that's walking by sight rather than walking by faith. And here we are doing the same thing Solomon did. His empire grew to its greatest heights. Wisdom was seen in his judgments, proverbs, and songs. How many proverbs did Solomon write? A bunch. Three thousand proverbs. We don't have all of them. How many songs? A thousand and five. Name one of them. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Song of Solomon. She's exactly right. I wonder why it's named Song of Solomon. <laughs> okay. He reigned for 40 years. We already pointed out the entire time was peace and prosperity. He dedicated himself to all these commercial enterprises. He not only built the temple, he built himself a palace. And he built, he had a large uh, stall for his horses, which they've discovered today. Uh, you can find those down southwest of Jerusalem. I mean, they had, he was an amazing builder of his day and age. Had a large naval fleet in the Mediterranean, and he controlled all the trade routes from Edom to the borders of Arabia, Africa, and India. And again, if you want to read all this stuff in Kings and Chronicles, it just unbelievable, just blow your mind. Tremendous well, thing. Make people work, you know, uh, they would have to go for a long time and stay. You know, That's right. Yeah, he had. They worked in uh, groups, David. Well, all he had to do to keep peace is trust in God. But you're right. He broke his covenant with God, built shrines of many false gods, and shortly after his death, the empire was lost. The kingdom was split in two, Israel and Jer Jeroboam and Judah and Rehoboam. So our conclusion, Solomon writes this in Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Is that the same today? And the answer is yes, it is. So. We got done with a little time left over. Anybody have any questions or comments about Solomon we didn't cover? Steve? I was reading where he might have been 12 years old. They thought he might have been 12 years old when he started to reign. Yeah, we need to look that up, don't we? How old he was when he began reigning? 20. 20? Okay, so he was still a youth. He Googled it once and it said he died when he was 50. And that would make him 12. Or so. Well, if he reigned 60 years, he'd be... I mean, 40 years, he'd be 60 if he started at 20. So we'll double check, Steve. What do you got? Yeah. Emily, you know something. Well, you're the, nu you're the numbers lady. I, I want to know if I did my math right. Oh, okay. Four on the temple of the nations. If you ask the feet, yes, you ask what I was telling you. You what? I had to calculate how many feet you How did you calculate that?
Just, just one and a half. 90 feet. That's all I want to know. 90 feet. Yeah. 90 feet. 90 feet, 30 feet wide and 45 feet high. Yeah. That's it. Do we know how long our pewter grid was? Well, they estimate 18 inches. So a one and a half is time is get to get to yeah. feet. And that's not exact because a cubit was from the elbow to the wrist. Yeah. Well, which man? Yeah. Little David or Goliath? You know, so that's, <laughs> Tip your finger? Okay, maybe it's tip the finger then, but still, it's not exactly exact what we would have today. All right, you guys can move to the back. Appreciate you being in class. Uh, thanks for listening carefully to our lesson tonight.